A few weeks ago we restored and repaired the Commodore 64C with a matching 1084S display. The Commodore had two bad sockets and the display had a dead flyback. Today we are going to restore a Commodore 1702 display to match the older Breadbean C64. We are also going to build a simple but fun project from the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Thank you PCBWay for supporting this channel. This display is pretty clean. Except for this white stuff here. I can't really tell if these are scratches or paint, so perhaps something else entirely. So the first thing I want to do is to use some IPA and see what happens if I try to clean this stuff off. Well, absolutely nothing so far. I'll keep scrubbing it and skip ahead here a bit. And we'll see what happens. I think it's coming off. Yes, it does. So definitely not scratches. This white stuff here is on top of the brown paint. I think some of that brown paint is coming off too. So I'll do the rest off camera and I'll be very careful not to scrub more than necessary. And I'll see how nice I can make it. Well, that was extremely tedious. It took me a good 40 minutes to clean that stuff off. But I'm not going to complain because the result is great. There are still two white spots left here, but I think those are scratches. IPA is very kind on plastics and paints, but sometimes, like in this case here, it takes forever to clean stuff off with. Anyways, I'm very pleased with this. This display is tested, but we need to check for refus before we start using it. I grew up with the Commodore 64 bread bin back in the 80s. But I couldn't afford a fancy display like this. Instead, I was using my family's obsolete Mitsubishi 14 inch color TV. I've been trying to find one of those for many, many years, purely for nostalgia, but no luck so far. So I bought this display from a school. But the funny thing was that no one at the school had ever seen anyone use this display. Instead, they had it on display no pun intended, to show the kids what computers looked like back in the 80s. So if this display was ever used at that school, there was no one left to tell. Anyway, we did a quick test. It worked, so I grabbed it. Okay, so far it looks pretty clean. Well, it's hard to see because there are so many shields here. But there is some suit down here. So it has been used. This part here looks like it would come off, and it does. The speaker is made in Japan. And I won't be surprised if we find more good stuff inside this display. I'll remove that speaker because I'm going to wash the case in warm soapy water. I think this display deserves a proper wash. I'm gonna have to guess here, because I've never worked on one of these displays before. And I think we need to remove this shield here first. The entire shield is moving, so perhaps we could remove the entire shield. But I'm gonna remove it piece by piece. Okay, that should free up this piece here. The tube is made by Toshiba. And it has a large sticker that says Black Stripe. Never heard of a Black Stripe tube. Some of the screws are not accessible from the back. So that must mean that the front cover has to come off first. It is however stuck in something, so let's have a look inside here. Ah uh, yeah, for sure, there's a screw here. So let's remove it. And the door, by the way, is not broken. And there's another screw on this side here. There's actually a third screw in the middle here. Okay, with those screws removed, let's see if we can pull the guts out. Yes, I think we can. But first, I think we need to remove the neck board. We also need to remove the cable and the connector for the yoke. We also need to disconnect the ground cable on the neck board since it's connected to the tube. It has a sticker that says caution. Be sure this wire is connected to earth tab on CRT sockets. Yeah, it sure was. And it will be again, after I have cleaned this display. Now let's try again. 
Yep. Rather unusual way to disassemble a display. Well, I suppose this is kind of service friendly. I guess you could connect the tube at the back of the display and work on it with the tube connected and be able to access all the electronics. Well, I had a look at the PCB and it's actually quite clean. So I'm going to leave it in. I also checked all the electrolytic caps. They are not bulging or leaking. I also checked the power supply. It doesn't have any refuss. Well, in that case, I'm just going to remove the tube and wash the case in warm soapy water and dry clean the tube. Okay, all screws are out. And here comes the tube. Okay, the case has been cleaned and dried and it looks great. So the 1701 and the 1702 were manufactured by Victor Company in Japan or JVC if you will. As far as I know, the only difference between the 1701 and the 1702 was the supplied cable. Otherwise, I think they are identical. This display's claim to fame was that it was an early display to have separate chroma and luma at the back. At the front, it also has a composite and audio jack. Start of production was 1983. Uh, this large chip's in here, you probably can't see it, has a date of 1984. So, second year of production, there wasn't much cleaning needed, so I probably spent about five minutes cleaning up some minor dust in here. Most of the caps are Nippon Chemicon. I also checked some random components, and they had Made in Japan written on them. So I think this is a really good display. The tube sits on these standoffs. So I think it's a pretty good guess that these displays were available with two different tubes. Now let's put that mystery black stripe tube back in. I thought that this stuff here was soot, but those black dots are actually inside the tube. And the usual disclaimer of course, please don't mess around inside CRT displays. They may be charged with high voltages, even with the cord unplugged. Before I continue with the reassembly, I always check for large gaps and make sure the tube is aligned. I'll reconnect that ground cable that we have been cautioned about to the neck board and the cable to the yoke. The display slides on two rails in the case. And now we can reinstall the neck board. Adjustment pots are easily accessible if needed. Next I'll reinstall the screws inside the door. I turn the screw anti-clockwise until I hear a clicky noise. That way I know I'm using the old thread. In hindsight, this display didn't actually need any cleaning inside. However, I think it's quite wise to at least take a look inside a 40-year-old display before powering it on. Uh, next I'll reinstall and reconnect the speaker. I'll be an optimist and reinstall the cover before we test the display. On stuff this old, I don't tighten the screws as I would on something modern. I'd rather have them slightly too loose. Although the plastic seems to have aged really well on this display. The case also includes this nifty plastic clip for cable management. One nice feature that this display has, that I wish all of my displays had, are these carrying handles. Every CRT display should have these. Okay, time for a test. I think this Commodore is working. Uh, let's find out. Yes, it is. Uh, my camera doesn't sync. And I better adjust that camera. There we go, that's better. Okay, that is a very stable picture. But colors are a bit off. I'll set the brightness and contrast to 50%. And I'll do the same thing with color and tint. Yeah, the colors are really nice with everything set to 
But I need to adjust my camera to show you what I see here. Yeah, this is roughly the same image as I see here in real life. So image is very stable. Colors are vivid. But the dot pitch is not amazing. So I wouldn't buy one of these unless you want a matching display for your bread bin. To test the display proper, let's build up a game cartridge. But we're not going to build a boring cartridge like this. Instead, I ordered some PCBs from PCBWay. And these are much nicer. We have previously built this Donkey Kong PCB. And I think it looks great. So I wanted to try this one out too. This is a really fun and easy project. And much easier to load than a floppy or a cassette. Also keep these on display when they're done. They look great among all the Commodore 64 stuff. So let's start with this 14 pin socket here. We might as well just solder all the sockets in one go. So next we need a 20 pin socket. And a wide 28 pin socket for the EEPROM. I'll use an extra socket to keep the board straight. This way all these sockets are going to sit flush. I'll start by soldering just one pin on each side. Roughly in the middle of the socket. This PCB looks great. It's going to look awesome next to my Commodore 64. And now we can check and make sure that all the sockets are reasonably straight. It's not necessary, but I like my PCBs to look nice. Uh, now that we know that the socket is nicely installed, we can go ahead and solder the remaining pins. I found these PCBs on the shared project page at pcbway.com and there are tons of fun projects on that web page. I don't know who designed this PCB, but the silk screen says Unforgettables of Commodore 64. So whoever designed it, well done, it looks awesome. Things have really changed since I made my first PCB. Back in the Commodore 64 days, I just bought plain PCBs and then I used a special marker with leaded paint. I drew all the traces with that pen and then I dipped the PCB in some really nasty acid and anything that wasn't painted over got etched away by the acid and then I cleaned the ink off. It worked, but it sure wasn't pretty. And nowadays we can order professionally made awesome looking PCBs like this. Probably cheaper than making one of those homemade PCBs back in the day. I'll clean that flux off right away. While it's still warm and easy to remove with just a Q-tip dipped in IPA. There's no need for a proper wash of a small PCB like this. Cleaning it like this is much quicker. Okay, that's clean enough for me. So next we need a 74 LS02. Oh crap, I installed this socket incorrectly. I'll just mark it. I don't think they have to be LS chips. We can probably do with an HC. In fact, instead of an LS chip here, let's use a 74HC273. I'm pretty sure this is going to work out fine. I installed that socket incorrectly because unfortunately I'm in a hurry. I have to travel. And when in a hurry, that's when we make all the mistakes. The third chip is an EEPROM. So we need to program the game onto the EEPROM. This is a 27C512. I found the game here. One load 64 games collection V5. That turned out to be a huge collection of games. After downloading it, I went to this alternative format folder here. And then bins and magic disk. And then 64K. There are a lot of great games in here. And here's Ghostbusters. You could install any game on any of these cartridges. But I'll go with the matching Ghostbusters. 
So in XG Pro, let's choose 27C512. Uh, this chip is from AMD. Uh, load up the Ghostbuster file. Uh, now we can program it. I'll reprogram it a few times because sometimes these old EPROMs can be a bit stubborn. Okay, that should do. And now we can install the EPROM. Now our freshly built cartridge. Okay, let's plug that PCB into the Commodore 64 and see if it actually works. Yes, it does. Awesome. I'll do my best to make a video next week too, but I'm not sure I will make it back on time. If not, next week is a good time to catch up with some videos you may have missed on this channel. I will end by saying thank you to my patrons, I appreciate your support. If you want to support me too, consider becoming a patron. Patrons get ad-free early access. If you liked this video, let me know with a thumbs up in the comments. If you're a regular viewer, consider subscribing to this channel. Thank you for watching, I'll see you next week.